Hello everyone, welcome to video number two. Wasn't it fun to learn about niches in video number one? I suppose I should highlight that sometimes people call these niches, just FYI, if you ever hear, hear that word, that means the same thing, just different way of pronouncing the same word. In this particular video, we're gonna learn a bit more about niches. And in particular, we're gonna focus over the course of these coming slides on how niches are differentiated from each other. So let's jump on in. Niches are differentiated by something that we call niche partitioning. Okay, that's the mechanism by which niches are differentiated. And there are many different mechanisms um, th that niche partitioning as a concept um, encompasses. Niche partitioning uh, occurs within ecosystems in lots of ways. And so I thought for these slides, I would just go over a few of the different ways to introduce you to these ideas. A, a, a really obvious way, which we used in the example in the last video, is that niches can be partitioned through resources that species consume. This is called resource partitioning, okay? Um, this occurs when species use different resources which can help them coexist. Resource in this context usually means food, but it can also mean living in different areas, such as heights within a forest. Um, or in different spaces. So space is just an example of a resource. A nice example of this is these handsome birds shown on this slide here. These are the um, Galapagos um, finches, um, where there is a famous, on the Galapagos Islands, there's a famous group of finches. There are 26 species that were studied by Charles Darwin, which I've introduced also in the macroevolution video on adaptive radiation. So these birds are found in the Galapagos, and there's a wide diversity in beak form of these birds, from big to small, as you can see here, um, that represents a diversity in function. Finches with small beaks are more able to consume small seeds, and finches with large beaks are more able to consume larger ones. So there is, in fact, amongst this group of species, a range of adaptations towards eating different food types as well, such as nuts, fruits, and insects. These have all evolved from a common ancestor, as I mentioned in the other video on adaptive radiations. These are an example of an adaptive radiation that was driven by the specialization of these birds to different niches via resource partitioning on the Galapagos Islands. So a nice example of resource partitioning. There is also such a thing as predator partitioning, and this occurs when a species is a, uh, or multiple species are attacked differently by different predators. A specific example of predator partitioning is a thing called the Jansen Connell hypothesis, and I've put the spelling of that on this slide for you here. This explains tree biodiversity in tropical rainforests. And this posits that host-specific herbivores or pathogens prevent any one species from dominating the landscape. So we're talking about, in particular, tropical rainforests, such as the ones you find in the movie Predator, which I think I stole this image from uh, for this slide here. When you have host-specific herbivores or pathogens, that will prevent any one species from dominating the landscape. If, if a particular tree species is too common, there will be few safe spaces for its seedlings to survive uh, a larger predator number, because uh, a very common um, tree species will su uh, support a large number of predators. Um, predators in this case will be host specific and they won't harm other tree species. So if a species becomes very, very rare, more predator-free areas become available because there are less predators around. And so species seedlings in that case will have a competitive advantage. Through cycles of this, there's a negative feedback that allows multiple tree species to coexist. This can be classified as a stabilizing mechanism. So that's an example of predator partitioning, basically when you have very, very um, uh, abundant and, and um, popular prey, you get more and more predators, and that stops any one species rising to dominance. I think that makes sense. I think it's a really nice example. There's also such a thing as conditional differentiation, and this occurs when species differ in their competitive abilities based on varying environmental conditions. So an example here is a desert, as represented by this um, image from Mad Max. In a desert, some annual plants are more successful during wet years, while others are more successful during dry years. Okay, makes a lot of sense. Okay. I also wanted to introduce 
uh, a thing called temporal partitioning. This is the partitioning of niches explicitly based upon times, and that can facil facilitate the coexistence of different species. So writ large and broadly, we can say that different animal species will tend to have um, species-specific um, activity patterns uh, uh, across any given day, um, and these are evolutionarily constrained. So typically you'll have some animals that are um, active at night, those nocturnal animals, and some say during the day. So those are partitioning their, their niche, their ecospace through the, the activity patterns um, throughout the day. A really extreme but cool example of how complex partitioning can can get in terms of times is cicadas, these beautiful creatures that you can see an example of on this slide. These are insects. They're actually true bugs, if anyone is interested in that. No particular reason necessarily that you would be, but they are members of the, a group called the Hemiptera, the true bugs. And they're a really extreme but cool example of um, temporal partitioning because there are groups of cicadas that have periodical life cycles that are really curious because they fall into typically prime numbers, typically 13 or 17 year life cycles. So cicadas spend most of their lives living below the ground as um, juveniles emerging, mating and then dying within a few weeks. By sheer dint of numbers because of how many of them there are, we think they're probably less likely to go extinct this way. However, the, the, the fact that these, um, there are groups of these that um, only come out in prime numbered cycles of years, either 13 or 17, um, is an evolutionary response, we think. Uh, and we think these developmental times represent an adaptation to prevent hybridization between broods with different cycles. So if you don't want uh, or you want to minimize the chances of hybridization occurring by two different species having one of these events at the same time, by settling on a prime number, you're far less likely to have coincidental um, broods occurring. These events are less likely to overlap as time goes along. So I think that's a really interesting example of temporal partitioning, and I hope you like it. That's the last example, in fact, of niche partitioning I have in this um, particular video. So I will see you in video number three, where we will be talking about paleo-autoecology. So see you there.